Hi everyone, it's Cammy here. Thank you so much for listening to this week's Heart and Hand. If you happen to listen to the shows on the Apple, Android or Spotify platforms, could you please give Heart and Hand a follow on there? They may also ask you to write a wee review and if you could write us a really good one, we would massively appreciate it. Thank you so much. Hello everyone and welcome to Heart and Hand, the Rangers podcast. This is your extra show for the week. My name is Cammy Bell, I'm your host as always. And joining me on what could be a fairly ranty extra this week is my very good friend Ross Hutton. Uh, Ross, um, have you calmed down yet after yesterday's uh, announcement? Um, at just after, well I think it was supposed to be half past three, just before four o'clock, that yet again... The Dundee Rangers game was postponed for a second time in a fortnight. Hi, Cammy. Hi, everyone. Just disclaimer right from the off. My voice still hasn't totally recovered from Sunday, so if it deserts me at any point, then I do apologise. But I think I would have been much more annoyed at the situation with this Dundee game if it came as any element of surprise, Cammy. But by this point, we know we're getting from Dens Park. That's the, the fifth cancellation they've had this season, and I'm happy to have the have the stats put to me, but I can't remember another club um, in a season like this having as many home games postponed as Dundee have. I don't think there there is anything within the SPFL rules that automatically allows you to throw the book at them or forfeit the game or anything like that because rationally, and I'm not in the business of calling the SPFL rational, but rationally, this doesn't happen. It shouldn't happen to a top flight club in Scottish football, so... It's it's embarrassing, but but absolutely not surprising. So we just need to kind of move on from it now. But it's it's just a, such a frustrating position to be in for a whole host of reasons that we'll get into. Yeah, and it's it's almost there's a great quote in one of my favourite TV shows, Ross, The West Wing, where President Jed Bartlett said, "Is it possible to be astonished and not surprised at the same time?" And I think about that when I'm considering this absolute farce that happened on Wednesday. For anyone who's been under a rock and hasn't had a chance to see the news, this game was obviously um, a, a, a rearranged fixture um, from the 17th of March. And uh, that was, again, due to weather conditions. And uh, on yesterday, Wednesday, we uh, were treated, Ross, to... Um, I suppose the best way I can put it is the this ability to foretell the weather, forecasting, some would call it, came into play to say that in Scotland, there was going to be rain. Now, that's a stunning revelation. Um, I think everyone can agree. And yet again, Dundee were um, putting out, I suppose, a little bit of a kind of PR exercise to say, no, we're definitely going for it. You know, as far as we're concerned, the pitch will be given all the treatment, etc. And then from Wednesday morning, um, pictures started to emerge of the rain, which I think had started around about 10, 11 o'clock up in Dundee. Um, the pitch was, was covered, and I'm going to use that in the old air quotes, um, and the worst parts of the surface of the park. Um, anyone who's seen the, the previous game that um, played up at Dens against Motherwell, um, which ironically Motherwell won, um, it was basically some parts were covered in grass and other parts looked probably not dissimilar to a sand trap at Augusta. Um, the, as news continued to develop, there was then another pitch inspection um, at 3.30, uh, wherein after, I think, about 20 to 25 minutes, the game was then called off. Now, Ross, you mentioned, because I did want to be able to try and, and look at this, because uh, this, as you rightly say, is a fifth postponement. Um, the one from last year was Aberdeen, uh, which was originally due to take place on the 21st of October, took place on the 30th of January. Uh, December, two days before Christmas, was rescheduled uh, for the 13th of March. Again, another game um, against Aberdeen. Um, 
Dundee against St. Johnson uh, was due to be played on the 2nd of January, was then rearranged for the 11th of February, and then our game on the 17th of March originally was supposed to be played on the 10th of April. Well, now, um, and let's keep everything crossed here, played on the 17th of April, so next Wednesday. Um, Ross, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the Rangers statement in a minute, um, but there was a fantastic... Uh, statement released by Dundee, um, I think it was the club secretary, uh, which basically said, uh, it's not our fault, it rains, we can't do anything about it. Yeah, I, I think what the club secretary actually came out and said was that rainfall in Scotland is 35% higher than it has been over the last 10 years, and that's the effects of climate change coming into play. So they're properly <laughs> scraping the bottom of the barrel here for excuses as if it's never rained in Scotland at all or ever before. Honestly, right, so you see that kind of excuse there, and they are properly scraping the barrel now, but if every other club in the country was having call-off after call-off after postponement, with this same issue of persistent and heavy rainfall, then I would have a lot of sympathy for it. Dundee are the only club in Scotland that seemed to struggle with this. Now, I think I there's think a lot the, of... The, sorry, sorry, just, to, just, to, just yeah. to pinpoint that, they're the only club on that street that seemed to struggle <laughs> with this. It's just such a, a, a staggering turn of events, and I think there are circumstances around Dundee and the way that Dundee are being run at the minute. They did let their ground staff go earlier on in the season, so I'm not entirely sure who is working on that pitch, if anybody, at the minute. But like I said earlier on, I'm not sure there really is a precedent for this. This, this is totally out with the, the normal set of circumstances that you would expect from a, a top-flight Scottish football club. And it's frustrating for, for all the clubs involved in that. It's Aberdeen, Muddle at the weekend, having their game only put on at the 11th hour. But from a Rangers point of view, and that's what we're here to talk about, it's so immensely frustrating for us. We want to have that game in hand played, first and foremost, so we can go back to the top of the table, hopefully, and, and have a much clearer picture about where we lie. But also, we're now going to have to be in a position next week where we are the only club playing in the Scottish Cup semi-finals who have a midweek fixture. It also affects the teams lower down in the league game who are fighting for a top six spot, but our primary concern is obviously on Rangers, and we are now being punished time and time again for the incompetence of Dundee. And I know you want to read out the club uh, statement, Cammy, so I'll let you do so in a moment, but they do not miss with it. And I was really happy to see that really strong position taken from Rangers today because over and above all that, over and above the on-the-pitch footballing aspect of this, there's the fans. There's the fans who have taken time off work. There are fans who are travelling from all over Britain to go and watch that game tonight who have done so for the second time and under the space of a month. I'd have been disappointed and let down again because of not unfortunate circumstances, because of the incompetence of Dundee. So I'll let you read out the Rangers statement because it's an absolute belter. Yeah, listen, you, you've, you've hit it right in the head and I think that Rangers have done exactly that as well with this statement. So I'll read this out. I'm certain that you'll all have, have had a chance to hear this already, but for anyone who hasn't, Rangers has written to the SPFL outlining its position following today's further postponement of the Dundee Scottish Premiership fixture. The negligence and unprof unprofessionalism demonstrated by Dundee Football Club, where they have repeatedly breached SPFL rules, continues to have a damaging effect on the top professional league in the country. In a week where record TV viewing figures were recorded for a match in the same competition, and this evening's game being um, due to be televised again by Sky Sports, this episode is deeply embarrassing and has been eminently avoidable. Rangers expects the SPFL to take proportionate and decisive action in accordance with its rules and the club will continue to make representations to them in the strongest possible manner. The club has been repeatedly put forward, uh, has repeatedly putting forward solutions to the SPFL, which have not been taken up. It has again proposed a solution to the preparation and execution of this rescheduled fixture and is awaiting a response from the SPFL as things stand. The rescheduled match will be on Wednesday, the April 17th at 8pm. The club considers this matter has been handled incorrectly throughout by both Dundee and the SPFL. At this time, we sympathise fully once again with our supporters, approximately 4,000 of whom were left, um, who were looking forward to attending uh, tonight's game, having already been left hugely inconvenienced and out of pocket by the first postponement last month. It is entirely unacceptable and disrespectful on the part of Dundee FC to have allowed this situation to have developed again. Um, 
listen, I, I, you know, I'm so proud of the club to be able to come out and make a statement like that because there's three issues here, Ross, right, as far as I can kind of break it down. And, and these are in no means of any kind of priority. I think for me personally, um, the, the first one has to be, as you've re- rightly said there, uh, the fans, the, the, the guys who go along to these games, who have to take time off work to go along to these games, um, pay money for them, arrange buses, do all of that legwork that goes into to being able to attend a top flight league match in this country yet again has now been hampered. There is um, the, the impact on the club because uh, the manager in his press conference on Tuesday afternoon had said, you know, they are going to travel. They are going to stay overnight nearby um, and go with every expectation and, and preparation that the game will take place as planned. That has now been, um, you know, scuppered. And the third thing, and I think that this is something that's really important as well, is I think that it, it, it becomes, I know we laugh about it in a kind of gallo humours type sense, but it does just show how ridiculous this situation can get into when the, the country's association simply doesn't want to be able to take any kind of form of punitive action against um, a club and almost, I don't want to say threaten, but almost put the, the situation back to them to say, you cannot, you simply cannot allow um, a scenario where the game will be um, in jeopardy four and a half hours before kickoff. It's not allowed. You cannot do that. So either come up with a plan B and in enough time, make a decision that if you need to have it at an alternate venue, and by the way, Dundee, I think we're talking, I think John Nelms had mentioned potentially playing at a neutral venue behind closed doors, not an option. You're not disenfranchising the fans any further. But the, 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 the SPFL have to be able to say to them, you have to come up with alternate options as to regards what happens here. And in sufficient time, so that the team, the opposition, and the fans, home and away, can make, you know, respective plans to be able to attend that. Now, obviously, we're just joking there about the proximity of Tanadice to Dens Park. Had they been able to then approach Dundee United and say, we need to be able to have Tanadice as a plan B, we need to be able to get it VAR ready, okay, fine. But there's 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 no requirement for any of that because if the way how this boils down to is that you can continue messing all of those groups around and the, the you know biggest broadcaster in the country for the second time and nothing's going to be done about it. That point about the broadcaster is really important as well, Cammy, because I think we all on this podcast have complained and complained and complained about the, the paucity of this Sky TV deal, and especially when you think that we broke viewing records for Scottish football over the weekend there with the old firm. But we've all came on and complained about the pittance that we receive from Sky as a broadcaster, but from their point of view, why would you invest more? in this product, a product that you're not actually getting uh, value for money out of at the end of the day because you're not even able to show the games because one club can't fulfil their end of the bargain. I completely agree with you as well about the playing games behind closed doors aspect and is this not the first time this season that playing games behind closed doors has, has come up as a potential solution to an issue? I think people need to recognise that the COVID season was a one-off exception in terms of playing a multitude of games behind closed doors. A one-off exception is now not the go-to answer that you can run to because there is a lifeblood of this game and that is, of course, is the fans who you can't disenfranchise any further. And as Rangers fans, why should we have to suffer not be able to go support our team because of the incompetence of another club? This is not a, a force majeure situation that completely outwith Dundee's control and I think we'd all have an element of sympathy for that. This is a problem of their own making, yet we would be the ones who would have to suffer from it. And then the big takeaway over and above that that I saw in the, the statement and I read there as well, Cami, is the sheer frustration from the club who have put multiple suggestions to the SPFL of how this uh, situation can be resolved, whether that is looking at alternative venues, whether that is reversing the fixture. That might be something that we need to look at. I don't know. But they've put multiple suggestions on the table here that have all been completely dismissed outright. And here we are again. Will we be in the same situation uh, next Wednesday? Who's to say we can? Because I don't think the forecast is to dramatically improve. 
so to speak. It might be a wee bit lighter rain, but that pitch doesn't seem to be able to handle any. So how far can this go? Because we need to get the split done as well. In a normal league, in a normal country, you could probably just punt this back into mid-May or something like that to make sure that there's absolutely no chance it can be called off. Again, you don't have that luxury in Scotland because we need to get the split done. So it has to be done and it has to be done soon. But we can't be in a situation, again, where we're now completely relying on Dundee to deliver a game that they are simply not capable of doing. And again, that has an impact on all the other teams in the league as well. It's not just Rangers. So I would hope that we would get support for this across the board, although I'm not holding my breath for it. Oh, no, listen, no one will care. And I think actually uh, on that point, the reason as to why the SPFL um, won't start to bring the hammer down because the conversation, I think, for me, Ross, goes into you play at a neutral venue, but you have to allow fans in. It has to be VAR ready. It has to be fit for broadcast, however else you want to be able to try and call it. Um, I did hear rumours that apparently uh, Dundee had approached other clubs with artificial surfaces in order to be able to try and get it. But then you've then got the issue of, OK, so how do you do that within you know the local proximity within reason how do you fit everyone else in there because you're going to assume that it's either got a matching capacity or greater and then if you're not willing to do that uh, then it is going to have to be a fixture reversal and now this is where other clubs or club who love to be able to try and get involved in bureaucratic processes uh, in the name of sporting integrity second time I've used the air quotes but I'm, I'm sorry for that listeners um, but in the name of sporting integrity, will not allow a fixture reversal. And they sure as hell, Ross, simply will not allow a forfeit, which means that Rangers get the three points. So it now starts to come into a world of, of politicking, which, again, is farcical because you and I and the, you know, the guys listening to this who would be going to the games, we're the ones who ultimately suffer for it because now it's more time off, now it's more travel costs, now it's another you know, rearrangement of our personal lives in order to be able to try and get to a game, which in, in the most bizarre scenario as well is, you know, critical to what we are trying to achieve this season. So obviously everyone is going to want to go. Everyone who can get a ticket is going to want to go. And so now we're back into a situation of um, it, it's putting the fans right on the back burner because we know it will impact supporters, but we don't care. And we need to be able to draw a line under it at some stage because of the split. Now, the split, for anyone listening who isn't aware of this, the split can still be determined following this weekend's fixtures, per se. Now, that obviously depends on a number of different factors. But as you've rightly said, Ross, take the split out of the equation. It buys us weeks of time that we probably could have rearranged all of this to be able to try and get put in. But again, because of the way how we run our football in this country, that can't happen. And I think for me, it, it's the lack of governance which really concerns me with this. I, I totally agree with your point um, that games can be called off, right? I, I understand that. I, I think everyone listening to this understands that. But this trend, and it is a trend now, of a repeated pattern of postponements it's not because of the weather. I'm sorry, I refuse to buy into that, Ross. It's because they have spent zero investment in that stadium and on that surface. And so the slightest bit of weather that 99% of the other clubs in the country, irrespective of level, can probably deal with borders on catastrophic at Dens Park. And it's 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 so comedic now. I, I feel even more embarrassed than I do about the current state of Scottish football. Anyone who's listened to Heart and Hand on the Patreon site for a while will know that James and I, when the B team were in the Lowland League, went up and down eh, well, down the country mainly, <laughs> watching the B team play in the Lowland League. And there was teams in there that took better personal pride in the pitches than what Dundee have this season. But you've hit the nail on the head, Cammy. The reason that the pitch is in this state is because they are penny-pinching on it, penny-pinching on that entire stadium. That's why it's fallen to bits. But as I said earlier on, they've also let their ground staff go earlier on in the season. That's another aspect of that penny pinching. It's all these wee things that have built up to this. It's not the case that, and I know we seem like repeating ourselves, but we need to hammer home this point, guys. This is not the case of the weather just having a massively adverse effect on Dundee Football Club because every other team in the country seems to manage it. 
It is an aspect and a, an aspect of conscious decision making, an avenue that they have went down that has led them down this route, and they should be punished for it. I completely understand the stand by what I said earlier on that the SPFL might not have anything in place right now within the laws of the game, within the the laws of our association to be able to punish them because this is such a a new situation, an infamable situation in many different ways. But they need to find a way to do it because this cannot continue. They will be a top flight club again next season. We cannot be in the same position twice. So the first and foremost fact is bad for the fans, but also it's bad for the product. It's an absolute embarrassment on our national game. Well, let's let's talk about that for a bit because at the manager's press conference on Tuesday in the build-up for this game, um, he has mentioned, uh, obviously, our current injury situation. Um, we are going to talk about Ross County shortly. Um, and I'm going to sound a little bit contradictory, Ross, because, you know, in previous shows, and as you've rightly mentioned on our Patreon site as well, um, prior to the international break, you know, if we said, you know, tired, leggy, in need of a rest once, we must have said it a hundred times. And there's a there's a benefit, I suppose, if you had to put any kind of form of silver lining on this cloud. No <laughs> no pun intended, by the way. That um we we do have further recovery time. Um the manager made mention in the press conference that uh, Ryan Jack is a longer term injury. Um Ryan Jack is not going to play for Rangers again. I think that's that's safe to say. Red Van Yilmaz was not going to feature on Wednesday night had the game went ahead. Um he did say about Yilmaz Ross that uh it looks like it's days rather than weeks. Um again, we will obviously hear in the press that we'll get in the in the upcoming days as to whether or not that means uh, Ross County is is too quick, or or whether or not it's he it still needs more recovery time for him to be able to get over that. However, um, uh, it's just so that we've got uh, enough on enough on paper that we can then say, I want to be able to field my best team possible. I want to be able to know that that game is going to go ahead. Dundee has bought us some degree of recovery time within that. Uh, I don't expect us to be able to see the Van Yilmaz uh, on on Sunday against Ross County, but now the manager is in this situation where he has to kind of keep these players ticking over. He has to be able to um, make sure that the, the the fitness levels are maintained. Whether he does that in terms of more physical work or maybe it's going to be some more analysis, he does a a, a pretty constant blend of that. But if I had to look at any degree of benefit from yesterday's cancellation, it allows us some more time for some of that recovery. Yeah, I I guess the other side of it is that you don't really have the, the time that you would have this game being postponed in, say, October or November to bleed these players back in over the course of a season. It's a, it's a sprint now. And that's the other concern about playing on this pitch, by the way. It doesn't matter whether it's tonight or it doesn't matter whether it's next Wednesday, whenever you want to play on it. There is a player safety aspect to this. And for us as a club in our own view of things, we are not a squad that's full of health and well-being at the moment. We're a squad that really is kind of breaking down all over the shop and is likely to do so again. So to go and play on that incredibly heavy, leggy pitch, that's a real problem for us going forward. And again, not one of our own making. But to take the point is on the face value about Red Van Yilmaz, yeah, I think we're all absolutely desperate to see him back. The old firm there with Sterling playing left back, I think he acquitted himself really well as he has done in any position he's been asked to play by the manager. But it does make us really lopsided, particularly going forward, because that's not his natural position. He's meant to be playing on the the right hand side of the defence. And for what Yelmaz gives us in terms of assurance at the back, but also that end product going forward, he is a massive miss when not in that side. I think Borna Barisic is a non entity now in terms of that discussion, really might play one or two games before the end of the season but I think it's pretty certain at this point that he's not going to be a Rangers player going into next season so it really is all about how fast can we get Red Van Yilmaz back because he'll be a massive difference maker in that side and be able to unlock other players to go and play in different positions like Dujon Sterling so it is imperative that we get him back as quickly as possible but we need to do it in such a way where he's not just going to break back down again as we have seen with returning players in the past because that would be an absolute disaster for us at this stage of the season. I agree, I think Ross County might just come too soon and then there's absolutely not a chance in hell you would play him in Dundee next week and risk him on that pitch, not for me anyway. So you're maybe looking at Hearts at Hamden as, as an opportunity to give him some minutes before the, the run in, in the league and then hopefully a Scottish Cup final as well. 
but it maybe does buy us that extra time that you mentioned there, Cammy, just to be able to bleed him back and give the other players some some rest after a particularly grueling old firm. Yeah, and I think, listen, you know, we can hope for the best but plan for the worst. The likelihood being, Ross, that uh, when we get into Sunday, um, I do expect it to be the case that Celtic will have won at home against St Mirren. Um, I think we probably said similar when we obviously lost them all and then they had to go to Tynecastle. So let's keep everything crossed. Um, that could mean that we are going into uh, the game against Ross County uh, four points behind. Uh, we're never going to say that, you know, there's this meaningless games. Obviously, every three points now is a must because, let's face it, we're cup finals now until the end of the season. Um, for me, I think there is still a psychological benefit of being able to have obviously played against Dundee, been able to go back to the top of the table and then try and just give them a little bit of a kind of seed of doubt because I do believe that the crowd at Parkhead get frustrated very quickly. So do we, by the way, but I, I just feel as if it gets taken up a notch over there. And we've seen games uh, that they've dropped points in at home this season where, uh, again, like I say, the crowd has shown frustration. The crowd has been able to... to I, I think it's it's bled onto the park and I think it's caused their players to, to have a stutter. What we need to be able to try and do is go on the assumption that we're going through there and we just really don't care what the league table looks like at that point. The most important thing for us is to be able to try and um, show, I think, the mentality that we saw in the second half against Celtic where... Uh, we know that the first half did not go well. I think that it's absolutely fine to say there's questions around that. We've obviously spoken about that a lot uh, in the course of the last few days. This time, if we can start really well, it just feels to me like we can make the job a bit easier on ourselves. We've not done too bad. Um, uh, you know, in, in, in away games at Ross County in, in recent periods. And I think that we're in a space now as well where the players probably took a lot from the second half and that recovery. Um, it, it's just really important to be able to try and say to them now, we need to be able to make sure that we don't have a similar first half malaise. Not that I'm suggesting for a single minute Ross County could go to Napoli against this, but what we need to be able to try and make sure of is we're very focused on being as clinical and as efficient as we can be just to make the job as easy as we can. You're absolutely spot on and if we can go in and hopefully take the game away from Ross County early doors then that possibly does open up that opportunity to give some more leggy players a bit of a breather if you can take them off and rotate them with the rest of the squad as well and then possibly you can even look to giving some players coming back from injury minutes too. So it'd be a massive, massive boost to go and have a fast start up there. Ross County as well obviously have an awful lot to play for. I think it's pretty likely they're not going to go down automatically now with the state of Livingston they're in but they are four points I believe behind St Johnston and kind of in that playoff place so they have a hell of a lot to kind of claw and fight for themselves and you watch it in every single league every single season where somebody in a relegation battle gives somebody in a title fight a bloody nose we need to make sure on Sunday come hell or high water that does not happen to us because like you Cammy, I'm fully expecting us to go in four points behind in any kind of slip up at this stage of the season could be fatal that's why um, I personally felt so relieved and, and, and so good after that game on Sunday because we're still in it, we're still fighting and the players showed a hell of a lot of grit and determination from my perspective to get ourselves into a position where Celtic aren't away and over in the hill like they would have been after a win I think some would say so we got ourselves into that position on Sunday we got ourselves out of that position but now we need to capitalise on that position, there's no point in putting in all that effort to go and, and get a result off of that, that Celtic team at Ibrox, given the position we found ourselves in, to chuck it away in the next game. It's been said countless times before that the, the two most important games are the ones either side of an old firm over and above that. You don't want to go and throw that all away so cheaply right after the effort you've put in. But like I said, if we can go and get a fast start up there, I think our record up there is, is fairly decent all in. Go and get a fast start up there, and then that gives us a fantastic opportunity to maybe rest some players ahead of a much, much leggier fixture that it ends on Wednesday. Something which I think is quite interesting, Ross, because um, if you remember um, the manager when we went through to, to play St Mirren, picked a team that didn't feature Todd Cantwell because he, he, he kind of made reference to the fact that he wanted to have a little bit more industry within the team, which I thought was quite, uh, quite telling. 
um, because there's going to be certain grounds, and, and, and certainly acknowledge Paisley is one of them, where I suppose the best way to be able to try and say it is that you know that you're going to be up for, for quite an intense fight. Now, this isn't you know indicative of the fact that you know Todd Cantwell can't be involved within some of that because I think Cantwell played well um, in the old fun game. Um, I think he's he's obviously still recovering from his injuries, so he's still got a little bit to go. You mentioned there, obviously, not having Red Van Yilmaz would probably necessitate Dijon Sterling playing back uh, at left back again. Again, I don't have an issue with that. I think what it does do, however, is it does have a little bit of that impact within the strength of our midfield. So would you be comfortable um, in terms of going with a similar three of, of Lundstrom, Diamandi and, and, and Lawrence to be able to start the game and Again, like you say, probably looking to start it solid, looking to be able to, to impress ourselves upon the game. If we manage to get a cushion, um, then again, we can start to think about player management and how we obviously manage time and legs, etc. Um, I would be really keen to be able to try and see how he approaches it. Any preference in terms of what you would think that that midfield could look like? I would be quite happy to start with with Cantwell in there, assuming that he is fit and ready to do so. I think you could see the difference that he makes to the whole entire team when he came on. Um, Against Celtic, he does offer us a level of dynamism that I'm not sure we really get from other areas of the park. And that, that's not in any way a slight on Tom Lawrence. I'm a huge Tom Lawrence fan, but I do think Todd Cantwell does give you that wee bit of something extra on the ball. I like the way that Tom Lawrence is, is calm and composed and tell you what, he's a hell of a playmaker himself. But there is a, a almost a volatility to Cantwell's play that I do think you need in a game like that where you would expect Ross County to kind of make it tough for us, sit and try and frustrate in that kind of way. Todd Cantwell's the kind of guy who can unlock a defence like that. I'd be quite keen to go with him from the start. Lundstrom and, and, and Diamandi as well do give you that security if you wanted to go with that. I wouldn't be overly surprised though if Lawrence and Cantwell both start because you possibly won't need that, that double pivot of security with uh, Lundstrom and, and Diamandi. The manager might be tempted to go with a more front foot midfield. It wouldn't surprise me at all, Cammy. Yeah, and listen, I think that that's, that's all about being able to try and create chances. And this is where an interesting fallout um, on Fabio Silva. So I, I've not had an opportunity to, to obviously state this within uh, our free shows. But I think you are very similar to myself, uh, Ross, that the theatrics of Fabio Silva were becoming a little bit frustrating, it's fair to say. Somewhat. With that being said, his, his his forward play generated an opportunity for us to be able to get back into the game. And by the way, for any of our Celtic chums listening, I will absolutely echo what David and Andy said on the flagship on Monday. It was a penalty because there was contact. Um, and in particular, if Michael Stewart's listening, I'm sorry, but that's a penalty. Uh I would like to think that you'd realise these things before, again, you were paid by a broadcaster to give your opinion, but that's a separate conversation. Silva, I think we, we need to be able to try and use now. Obviously, Sima has now started to come back into play. I still don't think Abdullah Sima is, is ready for 90 minutes. Any concerns around being able to, to, to start Silva? Probably, again, on the left-hand side, I would say, as long as he realises he's going to be up for a physical battle, he, he needs to be able to... Try. He, I, I have no issue with him reacting to being fouled, but there's an overreaction when he gets fouled, and that's what he needs to be able to, to remove, as far as I'm concerned. I would be very surprised if Silva doesn't start out on the left, because I'm, I'm the same as you. I don't think Seema's fit for 90 minutes. I'm not sure it's the kind of game that would lend itself to Rabi Matondo too much either, who would possibly be another option there, so I'm pretty certain I think it will be Silva. But the history onyx really got my back up on Sunday, and obviously I think he does really well for the penalty in terms of drawing that foul from, from Alistair Johnson, but and, and like you said, it, it is a foul. But the history onyx to do, someone has to have a, a quiet word with them and get him to drop them, because it, it does become deeply frustrating at times, and I, th- I think you can get a, re- a reputation among referees as somebody who will do that and then that's where that booking for diving and simulation automatically comes from, from John Beaton because he's sick of the sight of the histrionics and when that gets into a referee's head it's very difficult to shift and then a narrative starts and we all know how quickly people are ready to build a narrative about Rangers players in this country so it would be worthwhile somebody having a wee quiet word in his ear just saying listen, if you get filled by all means go down, one is free kicks, penalties, the works but drop the drop the play acting because it doesn't go down well up here. 
on the actual footballing side of things, he is a very talented footballer, a, a deeply frustrating one for, for me at times. Cause I think we can all see that the, the talent is there. But he is another one of those players, Cammy, that does have that ability to unlock defences when he is on his game and, and he is up for it. And given the... Uh, given the time of the season we brought him in on loan, given the importance of the season we're at now, we do need to see something big from him. I'm not sure he came up here just to be a, a bit part player in, in a season that didn't go well. I think he came up here to be successful and win trophies with Rangers. He can be a massive part of our success going forward, hopeful success going forward until the end of the season. And I think for the kind of player he is, and it's it's not his fault, but for the price tag that is attached onto his head, you want him to step up and give you big games and big moments. He has the talent to do so. That There's not a doubt in my mind about that, but I want to see it more from him. Well, you've also uh, segued nicely into what was going to probably be my uh, my last comment in terms of players and their contribution. Um, I'm going to give Rabi Matondo some, some you know, absolute credit. I think he's scored two absolute peaches against Hibs and Celtic. Um, and also, Kieran Dowell came on, um, brought out of the cold, I think is the phrase that would use, Ross. Um, I thought both players have, uh, on Sunday predominantly, but they came in, I think they contributed well. Kieran Dowell I was particularly surprised at. Um, and as you get into this tail end of the season, as you get into you know the real meat, um, these players could be really, really beneficial to us if they're able to hit a little bit of form as we get into the kind of closing chapter of the season. Now, I'm not suggesting starting Matondo or uh, or, or Dowell, you know, on, on Sunday in Dingwall, but what I am saying is oh, that these could be players that can come on that, worst case scenario, if the game is not put to bed and there's still some work to do, I think these could be some very effective substitutions to be able to bring on and just provide something a little bit different Sima is in that camp at the moment only because, again, he's recovering from injury. But thankfully, uh, he looks like he's recovered the form that he was in just prior to the injury, not the form that he was in at the start of the season. So, Dowell, I'm really keen to kind of get your thoughts on as well. But really for Matondo and Dowell, gives us two flank options, which we certainly could be doing with at the moment. And something, just as I say, a little bit different, just to try and mix it up slightly. Every little helps at this stage of the season, it really does. And I, I understand in any team you're crying out for quality, but my God, we need quantity as well. We need bodies at the minute. So anybody returning from injury is, is a massive boost to us. And like you, I, I wouldn't start Dowell or, or Matondo on Sunday. First of all, I think it's, it's too soon for Dowell. And like I said previously, I'm not sure it's the kind of game that would automatically lend itself to, to Rabi Matondo but they could be really effective substitutions. And that's obviously how Rabi Matondo has, has been used recently, and we've got our rewards from that. Now, that was an interesting sorry, one. sorry to cut in just really quickly, Ross, but one thing that I, I, I do not want to miss is he seems really happy with being able to contribute towards that, as you saw in his reaction old firm game, going straight over to the manager. I love seeing that. I love seeing that when he comes in. So no umbrage, no issues in terms of being able to come in and contribute because he's not starting. I thought that was fantastic. Fantastic team player, fantastic show of, of team spirit and solidarity. And as Matondo was speaking about after after the Celtic game, he said that the manager was talking to him about Kevin De Bruyne's goal the, the day before and asking him if he can replicate it because that's the top standard, that's the gold standard and obviously goes in and pulls that one out of the bag in the biggest game of the season. So he seems to be loving his football at the minute and it does speak to something within the entire squad that they do all love playing for this manager. And I think when we are talking about options and, and possible rotations and who's starting and who's not, you don't seem to get the impression that any of these players would throw their toys out of the pram if they weren't starting games regularly or or getting those kind of opportunities because I do believe the manager believes in a meritocracy. He's not just picking players for the sake of it. He's picking them on their ability and using them in the correct way and, and building that level of team spirit and solidarity to know that you will be used in the correctly, correct way but for the benefit of the team. So hopefully that, that message gets to other players as well. You think of young Ross McCausland, who hasn't started um, in the last couple of games, but he has more than played his part this season as well. He could be an option on the right-hand side if we don't want to go with Scott Wright as well. So 
it is pleasing actually, can we, to be in a position again where we can at least start to have these tentative conversations about options because for such a bulk of this season it's, it's really been I this is going to be year 11 because there's nobody else to play basically so it is quite refreshing to be able to have these conversations about who can play where because it means that we're at least in a, a primitive way moving back to a position where we can have depth and quality because we are desperately cl- crying out for that at the minute. Yeah listen I totally agree and um, it, it's I'm sorry for using the slogan folks but it is about everything from everyone at the moment and again because it's the only football at the moment we can reference back to Ross because of that that attitude in the in the second half of the old firm game it's really just about a continuance of being able to go into that um against Ross County really really important to do that again I, I am certain that the manager is going to tell them all you just need to ignore anything else that's happening outside of our group whatever that other lot do it's just about what we can do and i really hope the players take the turnaround in that old firm game as a, as a positive because it is a positive i know a draw is not what we wanted to understand all of that and listen the rest of the season will play out as it will but it's on to the next game and that's the most important thing um, and for me, again, it's that old cliche, Ross. It's just one game at a time. It, it just has to be, let's just manage it game by game. Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. We've got, obviously, that welcome you know, distraction of the Scottish Cup semi-final. But right now, all that matters is Sunday. Yeah, yeah, you're spot on. And as much as, as we as fans can look ahead to the old firm at Parkhead and what may or may not be with that from a playing point of view, it does just need to be one game at a time because I think we as fans, we are looking at it as, as going into Parkhead with a win as them taking them top of the league, but who knows what the situation will be like by that time. As it was said on the flagship as well, this is a bizarre season Cammy. strange things have been happening right throughout it and as I mentioned earlier on as well Strange things have happened in title races before where the, the minnows seem to get the upper hand. So our main focus right now has to be getting through Sunday with maximum points, getting through the Dundee game whenever God allows that game to be played with three points, and then we go into the split and then take it from there, one game at a time. Scottish Cup semi-final is a, is a welcome distraction because we want to be at the business end of all these competitions, and we are going for a treble currently. Let's not lose sight of that. Every trophy domestically could be in our cabinet come the end of the season. That's a massive achievement. But one game at a time will take us there starting on Sunday. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we're on to that. So if you are heading up uh, to Dingwall, uh, again, I, I, you know, Ross, myself and everyone else will be keeping everything crossed that that game actually still goes ahead. Um, I presume it will because, you know, they tend to look after their park and, you know, can accommodate such things as rain in Scotland. So uh, please enjoy yourselves. Please come back with three points. That's the most important thing. David will be back with you as per usual with the flagship to unpack that game and look forward to, again, fingers crossed, the Dundee game on Wednesday um, on the flagship next Monday. Um, thank you to our show sponsors, zenithcoins.com, um, and also to our executive producers, Mike Lee and Paul Myers. And most importantly, thank you so much to my good friend, Mr. Hutton Ross, um, tough to be able to do a review of a game that hasn't been played. But uh, listen, it's just the state of play of things at the moment. And as bizarre as all of this is, we still wouldn't want to ever not be able to talk about the Rangers. So thank you so much for coming on and joining me. No, thank you, Cammy. I hope everybody enjoyed this Met Office special of Hutton <laughs> this week. And I think my voice has just about held up through it. But it's always a pleasure to talk to you, mate. So thank you. Thanks so much. And uh, as I say, we will speak to you again next Monday, folks. If you can't wait until Monday, then please jump on over to our Patreon site where you will get tons and tons of content every single day, not just recent uh, and up-to-date Rangers news, but also some great uh, historical stuff on there as well when we look back at some of the key games and events in Rangers history, as well as the wider world of football and beyond. We'll be back with you on Monday. Have a great weekend. Speak soon. <laughs>